Welcome back to the Family Movie Night Podcast. My name is Nathan, and in honor of the movie that we are discussing today, Ralph Breaks the Internet, the sequel to Wreck-It Ralph from Disney Animation, I want to ask my wonderful co-host, uh, what is the first game, first video game that you remember just loving, being your favorite first video game? Donnie Dorsey, uh, the, the hero of our podcast, uh, wh what's your favorite, what's your favorite game here, man? Well, um, there's a lot of good ones, of course. Uh, but the first one that came to my mind was duck hunt. Uh, but I was always aiming for the dog cause the dog <laughs> always made fun of me cause I wasn't hitting the ducks. That, that stupid dog always rubbing it in my <laughs> face. Like he put his hand over his mouth going, <laughs> like you yeah. shut up dog. I got this. <laughs> you, you don't control my life. Uh, okay, very good, very good. Hey, and I'm excited to ask this question. Guess who's back, 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 back again, again, again. <laughs> Heidi's back, back, back. All right, here we go. Heidi Cooper, everybody. What is your favorite game you remember playing? Oh, man. So mine was definitely Mario Brothers, and then we got the Sega, and I switched to Sonic, and it was it was all over from there. Sonic, who has a very big cameo in this movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even more enjoyable than his actual feature film <laughs> that he got. <laughs> that se seven seconds he got on screen, much more enjoyable. But of course, we have to talk to the villain of our podcast, which in this one, in the first film, Wreck It Ralph turns from villain to hero. But spoiler alert, uh, Wreck It Ralph's personal toxic behavior. <laughs> so, uh, speaking from uh, the villain of our podcast, Wreck It Ralph's toxic characteristics I, I am the personification of insecurity okay Very good. that is that is what i am sorry um, Hugh, hewlett what was your favorite uh first video game okay this is like it's like a tie i, I i'm gonna say like the first game that i loved was super smash brothers mm. 64 okay yeah, okay there you go that game blew my mind but then I played Halo for the first time, and it was all over from then on. I may so, have been in high school when, I know. when Halo came out, but that's okay. No, nah, I probably I bet it was in middle school. I bet it was in middle school. So. I all was right. like seven or eight the first time I played Halo. No, now I'm all I, I only know Halo because my kid played. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good, very good. All my toxic insecurities are coming out right now. <laughs> to the Family Movie Night podcast where we want to help your family have better conversations around the content you consume. My name is Nathan and I'm joined as always by the hero of our podcast, Donnie, uh, just the, the, the bringing a lot of elegance and grace and beauty to our podcast, uh, Heidi Cooper, and of course, uh, the scummy villain <laughs> of our podcast. It's just getting worse every time, Sawyer. Every time it's just going to get worse. Uh, of our podcast, Sawyer Hewlett. And today... This is going to get real close to like defamation levels of that <laughs> before right. I just quit the podcast. You're going to just start opening up all the libel yeah. <laughs> laws, getting into it. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we are talking today about Ralph Breaks the Internet. This movie is the sequel to Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, my guess is if you've got young kids in the house, you've at least seen one of these movies. This one takes place six years after the first one. Ralph and Vanellope, who are now friends, discover a Wi-Fi router in the arcade and that leads them to a new adventure where uh, in order to save the game, Sugar Rush, uh, that is Vanellope's game, in order to save it, they have to go into the internet, they have to go to eBay and pay way much, uh, way too much money for a part for their game and uh, get that money in order to save the game. That's what's going on in Ralph Breaks the Internet. But Donnie, what, why don't you tell them what's going on on this podcast? What do we do here? Absolutely. So on this podcast, we encourage every family and community Christian church to have a monthly movie night to help you and your children build memories, start conversations that matter. So the goal of our family ministry is to help you raise your children to love Jesus and his way of life above all other things. And we know that critical to that is for you to have routine, regular times of connection and shared experiences that help you build stronger relationships. 
movie nights are a great opportunity to do that because movies, they're not just an easy way to share laughter and joy, uh, also fear and sadness and a safe environment. But, you know, they also give us a chance to talk about what matters to us in a way that is meaningful and, and memorable with our kids, you know. And on this podcast, you know, we we want to not only recommend some movies that you could watch uh, on your monthly movie night, but even uh, give you some ideas for like meaningful conversations that you could have with your kids during uh, or especially after the movie. And as always, the point of this podcast is not to add another thing to the list of things that you as a parent feel guilty because you're not doing. We want to make it easier for you and your kids to enjoy being together so that you can build memories and have conversations that matter. So throughout our conversation today, remember, we want to have fun and help you think through simple and easy ways to share your love of Jesus with your kids. And we actually want to hear from you. So you'll see in the description uh, of whether this video or the podcast, if you're listening to it, there's a link to a form called What We're Missing. Uh, this could be a place where you recommend a movie that you want us to cover. In fact, next week's episode, we're going to be covering a movie that someone suggested to us. Uh, you can put that in there. Or if there's a movie like Ralph Breaks the Internet that we've already covered, but you thought we didn't do a good job discussing it, you had some either conversations you had with your kids or ideas you wanted us to talk about, throw that in there. If you got questions, you got comments, you got things you want us to know, things you want us to talk about. How do I talk about violence in movies with my kids or talk about language in movies with my kids? Any of that kind of stuff, throw that in there. We may do an episode on that. So we just want to know who's watching and how we can serve you better. So just stop by even just to say, hey, we would love to do that. But right now we're going to talk about Ralph Breaks the Internet. Uh, this is a movie directed by Phil Johnston and Rich Moore. Rich Moore, who I think I first remember um, as a like uh, director for The Simpsons and Futurama. He went on to do, do some work for Zootopia and Wreck-It Ralph and things like that. Uh, but uh, it, this is a really fun movie. It's a very emotional movie. Uh, it's got stuff for really all ages, young kids, uh, teenagers, adults, I think are going to love it. As we talked about in our previous episode on My Neighbor Totoro and uh, Studio Ghibli, uh, I think that uh, this movie, just like Pixar does everything, is better for adults even at times than it is for kids. Uh, so let's just talk first what you guys uh, enjoy about this movie. So, um, Sawyer, why don't you start us off, man? What This was your first time, I think, watching Ralph Breaks the Internet. You said you yes, watched it, it last night. Yeah. And it wreck it, Ralph, wrecked you. So, Correct. Yeah, Correct. talk about that. Yeah, so my, I mean, probably like my favorite aspect of the movie is just the, the Ralph Vanellope dynamic. Um, the, the, uh, the problem that wreck that uh, Wreck-It Ralph has in the movie that Ralph has is a very relatable one. And, uh, at least for me personally. Um, and so I, I really like that aspect. Um, I'll honestly, I, every time we talk about an anime movie, I harp on this, but I just, I think it's really great. Uh, the vocal performances are pretty good in this movie. Um, John C. Riley again. I mean, this is just, I, he is really good in the movie. Um, and then also, I look, you, we briefly mentioned it earlier with, with the Sonic reference. I love a movie like this that's just like chock full of fun pop culture references. And this movie has some great ones. Just like, and like the first one, if I remember correctly, also had some really good ones. But this one, this one takes it to like a whole new level. And it even like, it's funny because like there are certain brands that they like don't want to like use the exact version. So they basically just like use a stand in for YouTube and stuff like that. And it's, it's really funny. I, I really enjoyed um, also the, like the world of the internet was so cool and really creative. So I, I really enjoyed this movie. Well, and it's really well realized. I think one of the yeah. things that people love about Pixar and Disney animation is how really thought out and clever the worlds are. That that, that it actually seems like a uh, a world that people could actually live in. Uh, you know, like the Toy Story, all those kind of things. You, you you think about, you know, Finding Nemo. I think is maybe one of the best examples of like the underwater world has an economy that makes sense. <laughs> has has like a school system that you're like, I let my kids go to school there. Like the whole thing makes sense. Fish so I, infrastructure. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think 
a lot of that works in this. Now, my experience was, uh, once again, this is kind of my harping on, I think Pixar and Disney understand adults better than they do kids. Not all the pop culture references were for me because they were way over yeah. my kid's head. Donnie, did you watch this with your kids? What was, what was kind of your experience with this? Oh yeah. My kids have watched this probably like three, four or five times. Um, and every single time they, they don't get all the references, but I will get, I will say this. They do get some of them because they've either seen the game in some context right. or I've mentioned it. So like, you know, me being part of the culture that they kind of were like making the joke story. I was like, I'm like, oh, this is such and such. And they'd be like, okay. And then, of course, like a month or two months down the road, they'll be like, so, Dad, can I run like Sonic? I'm like, oh, my gosh, you remember. <laughs> yes. Well, even the fact that this movie is named Ralph Breaks the Internet, which refers to a very specific thing that you would not want your kids to know about, is very strange yeah. to me. But anyway, uh, Donnie, uh, what do you just think every time you watch this movie? From your perspective, parent perspective, what do you love about this movie? I just love the, the depth that it goes in for like each of the each of the characters. Like each character has a specific value that they add as a whole but mm -hmm. very much individually because, you know, you look at Ralph as like this kind of very like normalized person that just, just is there. He's present. He just likes to be in the midst of people, you know? And then you got Vanellope that's just like totally like, I want to be, I want to be everywhere. I want to do everything. I want to, I want to, I want to experience the world, you know? And it's, I love watching those characters interact and then everything else. Like, I mean, like Felix and all of them, there's a ton of good stuff in there. Yeah, this movie, more than the first movie, uh, feels like a, and I don't mean this in a bad way, um, it feels like a sitcom episode. There's a lot of like A plots and B plots and C plots. Like the whole the whole B plot with Felix and uh, his wife, I can't remember, let me see if what's, what's her name, Calhoun, yeah. adopting all the <laughs> princesses is like, it really could be excised from the movie altogether. You'd save yourself 15 minutes, but it's funny. Every time it comes out, it just makes you laugh. I mean, it is just, it is silly. It is high energy. It's very emotional. Um, it's a little longer than I remember. Like it's almost two hours, but uh, my kids never are bored in it and always seem to have fun. Heidi, did you watch this with your kids? Uh, what, what, what was your experience? Yeah, I watched it with my younger, um, my youngest son, and um, he, okay, so I can't lie, I was more scared about um, the Ralph monster at the end than he was. I was super <laughs> creeped out by it. I did not, I honestly didn't think that Ralph could be creepy to me until that point. Like, they always talk about, you know, he's a huge hobo. Right. But, um, yeah, so I, uh, he loved it. He thought it was really funny, um, and he liked, you know, the way it ended, but... I think the thing that I like the most is that like whatever you think a character will be like in this movie, it's usually the opposite. And so like right. Ralph, the princesses, even like the little, um, all the little candy racers that you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. Felix and his wife, like all those things, they just bust up all the stereotypes. And I love that about it. I love that everything looks different. And then like you guys said, the internet, the, that whole world was amazing. The birds, tweeting in the tree and I was like oh man this is this is um they really came up with a lot of clever ways to display all the different stuff that was on there yeah. and the ads the ads the pop-up ads oh yeah. yes oh yeah Bill Hader's performance just oh, top, oh top, so top good. notch uh, we'll get to that uh, that'll be part of our lightning round so you guys can be thinking about that who is your favorite you know like side character or, or you know guess there's so many this thing is just this thing is like the internet itself is chock full of nonsense and uh very good so i think we're all recommending this would be a great movie i think teens will like it once again um you know when we were talking about Encanto of whether teens would like it or not yeah teens are weird i would have not liked this movie when i was 16 but teens are weird these days i'm just telling you there are a lot of 16 year olds are gonna this will be their favorite movie so uh i think you can watch it uh with anybody in your family and they will have a great time with it so let's now get into what the theme of this episode is what what you've already seen maybe the reason you click this which is really the theme of this movie and really the villain of this movie is uh the concept really of insecurity uh, so to give you an idea of, of what the movie uh, is, give a little more plot details if you haven't seen it. So when you watch it, you can be able to talk about it. Ralph and Vanellope, 
uh, Vanellope has said from the very beginning of the movie that she wants things to be different. She's tired of racing the same track every day and doing the same thing every day. And then this Wi-Fi gets plugged in. And I remember the character, I can't think of his name, but he's like kind of like the he's like the surge protector. I remember that from the first movie. He's the guy who's kind of making sure all the games are uh, like this big like terminal uh, airport terminal type thing between the games. Uh, he says. Uh, the internet. All you need to know about it is it is new and it is different, and that means it's scary. And I, which I thought was very funny, but I, I, that's his way of branding what the internet is. Well, Vanellope here is new and different, wants to go explore. Ralph says, "Well, in order to keep her from going and exploring, let me make this new track in the game so that she'll stay here and do what I want her to do." And that ends up wrecking the game. Uh, a kid ends up breaking the handle, uh, the steering wheel on the console. They have to go buy a new one. But Ralph then begins to get afraid that Vanellope will not return to the same old, same old and becomes this. Uh, he ends up unleashing a virus on the Internet, which is an insecurity virus, very properly named, because it is looking for insecurities in the system and like the network. But it also exposes all of Ralph's insecurities he becomes the villain all of his needy and i wrote this down this is the way they described it it's his needy clinging and self-destructive tendencies become the villain of the movie and so we kind of w watching this said you know and i'll say for me i had a great conversation with my kids about what insecurity is because my i have kids that are 10 down to five and they've never heard that term before but they certainly knew what it was uh to feel like there's something about me that in the way I said it was there's something about me that other people won't like. And so I need to do some things to make sure that people either don't see that or ignore it or whatever. I try to do, I, I feel bad. And so I end up doing bad things. And so we wanted to talk about how do we have that conversation with our kids in a way, one that honors Jesus and honors other people. And so Donnie kind of had brought up, and I want you to talk about this a little bit, Donnie and Sawyer, you jump in on the same conversation because y'all were talking about the same thing, which is to talk to our kids about how insecurity, feeling bad about yourself can often wreck your friendships, that you can become like Wreck-It Ralph and you can wreck friendships. So Donnie, do you want to start off with that, what, what you saw in this movie about that? Yeah. Like, so, I mean, of course, like as you're, as you're seeing, um, Penelope and, um, Ralph's relationships slowly grow. Um, you see that as as things change, Ralph becomes more and more visible that he's insecure about things that he doesn't have or doesn't desire, like or like want more of. And like it's so prevalent because every time Vanellope's like, "Hey, I want this," he thinks, "Oh, I just need to make this happen," and then everything will. Well, then we can continue doing what we've been doing as normal. Yeah. But his, but through that, like his insecurity continues to make him do things that he thinks are beneficial to his relationship, like his, his friendship with Melody. But what it ends up actually doing is creating a lot of distance because of the way that he approaches it and the way he tries to um, continue to like interact with her. Like yeah. it's always about that. It's like, well, you know, I want to do this. Oh, you want to go on a special track? Cool. I'll build one for you. He doesn't think about the consequences or anything that goes with it. He just wants to, he feels like it's kind of that way that I think as parents, sometimes we feel like if we let them get the itch of something out of their system, then they won't want this anymore or they won't want this anymore for whatever reason. And I think it's the same thing with our friendships. Like, ah, oh, well, if you just go do this, then you'll be back and we can just go back to what it was. Like, yeah. is that idea of wanting what it already existed versus the opportunity for what could be kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and I think what you see a lot in, in Sawyer, maybe you can talk to this to some degree. I think what you see a lot in the movie is this desire Ralph has is to not let her explore opportunities away from him. Like if you explore something that I'm not a part of, that means you and I can't be friends. Right. And certainly I think our kids experience this as they grow older when they're really young. They don't think about it a lot. But the older they get, you know, later elementary school, early middle school, certainly in high school, there's this kind of needy, clingy, smothering nature of, well, if you're my best friend, that means we do everything together. And that can often backfire. Sawyer, you want to talk a little bit? Yeah. about that? Yeah. Well, yeah. And like, I, I think like what what I connect with so much in this movie is like. It's funny, you you mentioned, Nathan, that like, yeah, this movie's probably for teenagers, pretty good, going to work for teenagers pretty well. Like, I think this movie is like for teenagers. Like, this story is a story that like teenagers will probably like 
snap into like tune with really quickly because the movie, like I, I know just like me personally, that's like a journey that I went on uh, when I was in high school and then again in college and stuff like that. Um, and it's this, it's this very um, universal struggle that I think if you're going to have healthy relationships, it's kind of like learning how to deal with ins- your own insecurities and how those relationships change is a key to like keeping those friendships and stuff like that. And so that like, just like on the conversational level, that's going to be something that like is potentially going to be very valuable, I think for you and your kid to talk about. Um, that being said, like, I think like it's all embodied, like the first act of the movie is kind of just establishing their personality differences. Um, Ralph is this very, um, and I, I'm not saying this negatively because I definitely identified with Ralph more so than Vanellope in this movie. Ralph is this very simple kind of minimalistic person. He's like, I don't want to leave. I don't want that much of my life to change. I love the life that I currently have. And rather, I love the life that I developed in the first movie is the thing. He developed, what ex- he got exactly what he wanted at the end of the first movie. And he's had exactly what he wanted for like six years now is the thing. And so now the idea of the key thing that changed that like created that awesome chapter of his life, the idea of it going away is terrifying to him. And like, that's something that I personally have identified with very much. So, um, and then near the end, as all of his insecurities start coming out and stuff like that. And like, I just love the idea that your insecurity is essentially like, a big Voltron that's going to, they're all going to come together and really start doing damage on your life. That like, I also really loved the idea because that's also something that's like super real world and stuff like that. And so yeah, again, near the end, when, when he kind of has to fight his own insecurities for lack of a better phrase fight, but um, it, it's really, really relatable and stuff like that. And so yeah. yeah, I just I think it's a very timely, especially especially because the movie is very much about social media and stuff like that. Not well, the Internet in general. Social yeah. media is a part of it and stuff like that with eBay and stuff like that. And uh, I, I love the uh, the little I think Heidi might have mentioned this earlier, but like the little Twitter birds and stuff like that. <laughs> it's just it's a very, very good and timely story. Yeah, I was thinking about something else off of what you were saying, too, is that like it's that value we think we bring to a relationship, a friendship, especially. And that if we don't have that thing that because we feel like when we go into a relationship a friendship, whatever it may be, that, hey, if if I'm the funny one, I have to always be the funny one. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm the smart one, I always have to be the smart one. And I think sometimes as far as like and this really relates to our children, because. The idea is that they start to identify in those things in a relationship. So when something changes, they forget that it wasn't about what they could do. It was who they were and about them as a person. And I think that's something you see clearly in Ralph as he struggles with that. He's like, well, I, what I, I'm supposed to do is this. This is what I do. But I'll yeah. be like, this is how I live life. This is what we do. This is our relationship. And the second mm-hmm. that starts to change, she becomes extremely insecure and wants to step back he's like i don't want this because i don't know what to do like i don't know where my place is i don't know where i fit in kind of thing well and i think you know we've talked about this before but that's the nature of it right is when you form yourself an identity you over identify yourself with that thing i'm this you know in kanto we talked about that i'm this gift i'm this talent and if i can't do that or i can't be the one who does that and our kids are looking for that. That's part of where they are psychologically. Um, part of their, you know, actual growth and development is that they need to identify. I'm good at these things. I have these relationships, but we have to help guide them through. But you're more than just those things. You're more than just those things. You know, one thing I noticed from this, and then I want to toss it to Heidi about something she was talking about. This virus that comes out. It's very snake-like in the way it moves. And I said to my girls at one point, I said, you know. That virus is a lot like Satan, and that what Satan does is that he speaks into our head all the insecurities we have, and he's trying to highlight. I said, whenever you have a voice in your head that tells you you're not good enough, or you're not smart enough, or you're not pretty enough, or you're not funny enough, or you're not whatever, that is not Jesus speaking to you ever. 
I said, even if you've done something bad, Jesus is never saying to you, you're not good enough to be loved. He may say that thing was bad and you shouldn't do that thing, right? Jesus says, go and sin no more. So Jesus is not denying the bad things we do, but Jesus is always speaking love to us. And that this virus gives us a chance to talk about the nature of temptation and sin, that when that you are more likely to do bad and hurtful and damaging things like Wreck-It Ralph when you feel insecure and bad about yourself and when you allow that to be the voice that's in your head. And so that's what we talked a little bit about from all the stuff you guys said is when I'm so insecure in my relationships, right? When I'm so insecure in myself and my identity, that leaves a doorway for Satan to speak to me and to say things to me that aren't necessarily true. They may be partially true that I did something bad or that I'm not the funniest person or I'm not the smartest person. That all may be true. There will always be someone smarter and funnier if you look hard enough. But it's not the whole truth. So Heidi, talk a little bit about this because this kind of is the thing that kicks everything off. You mentioned that when when insecurity is an issue, and this happens a lot for teenagers, children, everyone, adults as well, when change is introduced, change ramps up for many people their insecurity. This kind of unpredictability does. And I want to throw this quote out that you said to us before we started filming and let you riff on it a little bit is you said, when that happens, I have to get to a place where I don't have to change myself for you, but I also don't have to make you change yourself for me. And I think yeah. that's a huge thing to talk to our kids about. Can you talk about that idea of one, the unpredictability of change? How does that in interact with our insecurities, but also that quote that you, you said, I thought is huge. Yeah. So I think that, that um, kind of idea that uh, Penelope was mostly like here for the fun. She was here for the excitement The she thrived on like the difference the you know, the changes, the, the constant, you know, variables of life. Whereas Ralph, his, he's, he seeks control and he seeks, you know, familiarity and safety and that is us in life. You know, we're all different. We all have different things that drive us and motivate us and energize us. But I think that the thing to realize is, you know, you see at the end or towards the end of the movie where he's doing all of these things based on his own insecurities. And they're all like really wild and crazy, dangerous things. But he's just doing all these things to try to get it back to security, stability, familiarity, no changes. And she's doing them all to like discover herself and to change and to like find where she fits and things like that. <clears throat> but you see how she all of a sudden went from just being totally on board with whatever he wanted to do and however he wanted to spend their time and things like that to she's actually lying and like keeping things from him to continue to live the way she wants to live. And so I think it just insecurities in us tend to also manifest, you know, or bring out um, insecurities in other people. And so she didn't feel comfortable being herself around him because she knew that that didn't make him happy. And I think that's the thing that we have to try to remember is in our relationships is that, you know, I can enjoy these things, you know, I'm more, you know, more like Sawyer. And then I know that, the, you know, there's other people who like, they want constant change, constant variation. And you see how at the end, they have this amazing relationship, and they're still so connected, and so close, but they've accepted each other, and they're living their lives in the way that fulfills them the most. So you really, you know, hinder yourself and others by trying to, you know, control out of insecurities versus just saying, I want you to be who you are because who you are is who I love. That's what matters. Well, and I it's can't... funny. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, Heidi, like, I think like what's so I like what that reminded me of is like, again, like Ralph has this, this, I, this presupposed world that he's built up in his brain of what is the good life and stuff like that. And then when when someone else is like, yeah, but your good life isn't necessarily my good life. That just, that melts his whole worldview away and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I, I totally love what you're saying there, Heidi. Well, and I think, I think what, what, and I, you know, the movie hits on this. The movie is not from a Christian worldview. So I think you as a parent are going to have to take this conversation beyond the movie. And I think that's something that we have to, 
you know, we don't always say on here, but I think it's important you should know is no movie is going to perfectly represent. We're trying to highlight the aspects of a movie or a film that, that kind of fit with the kingdom of God, but not all of it will. And I think with this movie and what Heidi's kind of hitting on here is that I can't control you and love you. That that's the nature of love, right? God is love and God by his nature gives us free will. He will never impede our free will because he loves us so much. He knows that love requires you to be able to have a choice. And what Ralph is trying to do in this movie and Vanellope, because you're right, Heidi, they're both, trying to control the other one. And one of the ways that they're doing that is uh, Vanellope says, if I don't give you all the information until the last second, you can't talk me out of it. God, how many teenagers and parents are doing that with each other? I just won't tell them until it's too late and they can't make any other decision. Uh, well, that's not love. That's not respect, right? Obviously, when it's a four-year-old, it's the it, respect and love look different. But when you're talking about a person who is either nearing adulthood or is an adult, respect means I give you the information you need to make a, a, a decision. I honor you in that way. And Vanellope's not honoring Ralph. And Ralph is obviously not honoring Vanellope because he's not listening to what she wants and what she what she needs out of the situation. And that what we yeah, can I think oh ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. I think I would take it a step further and just say that not only can you not only can those two things not operate together. But when you try to control, you destroy the love in the relationship. Oh, yeah. You actually, mm -hmm. you it diminishes the more you try to control, especially, you know, controlling and insecurities. Is yes. And so I think it's, I think our, our, our kids and teenagers are going to deal with insecurity in different ways. I see this with my little kids in the insecurities they have in their relationships with one another, that they kind of realize my, you know, their siblings are kind of realizing we don't all like the same things and we don't all do the same things. And like, I have one daughter who's about to have a birthday party and she wants it to be pink and princessy. I have an older daughter who's like, that's stupid. Everything should be dark and, you know, in a Batman movie. And like, and she wants everything to be kind of teenager and edgy and, and they have this conflict and my younger daughter is like, well, maybe I should change it. And I'm like, look, it makes sense that you like what you like and she likes what she likes. And you two are sisters and you're going to love each other even if you don't like the same things. That loving people is about more than agreeing with their decisions. It's about more than thinking they're always right. Or that, like Heidi said, you don't have to change yourself to someone who wants everything to be dark and, you know, edgy and that. And she doesn't have to come to your party and pretend that she likes pink because she likes you. She doesn't like what you like. She likes you. And then obviously when they're teenagers, insecurity is the air they breathe, right? Because of the way I look, because of the way I dress, because of the way I talk, because of the things I like. And then you start doing things and behaving in ways. So having that, that, that don't honor God, don't honor other people, don't honor yourself that's when things become dangerous. And for us to be able to have that conversation and to even have the conversation of, hey, when you're having these thoughts, that's Satan speaking to you. So here's something I said to my kids, and I kind of want to just wrap it up here with our kind of theme talk so that we don't go too long on all of this. But what I said to my kids at the end is, hey, I hope you know there is nothing that you can ever do or think or want that you can't talk to me about. And I will do my best to listen to what you have to say, because I do think in the big part of this is it is our job to help guide our children through their insecurities. There's no way to remove them. I look at my little girls and I already start to see their little self-conscious like, oh, that was a stupid thing to say. And, oh, I have one daughter who comes to me all the time and goes, do you think I look pretty? And I say, yeah, I think you look pretty. And she goes, do you think other people will think I look pretty? And I'm like, you're six. I don't want you having these thoughts, but there's no way to protect her from that. That is human nature. I can't. And parents trying to shelter and protect her from ever having those thoughts is not helping her because one day she will and she just won't tell you about them. She just won't ask you because she thinks dad doesn't want to hear that. Mom doesn't want to hear that because moms and dads. And I know I know what you're doing because I feel the same way when you say to your kid, that's stupid. Don't think that. Don't think that about yourself. Why would you ever think that about yourself? That isn't helpful because what you're telling them is that thought you have that feels very real to you. It does. It, it, why, why talk? Don't even talk to me about that. That's not even worth talking about. Being able to say to your kid, hey, I do understand why you feel that way. And do you know I felt that way a lot in my life? Being able to have those conversations, guide them through it. Because this movie ultimately is about a dad letting his little girl move, grow up and move on. 
And his fear is if like most parents, when our kids are graduating and moving on to other things is, is she going to leave me and never come back? But the end of the movie was him on a zoom call with his daughter <laughs> while she was off at college, living her best life with Gal Gadot, which look, if you can go be best friends with Gal Gadot, go do it, go live your best life. Uh, but that's where it is. Okay. So I just kind of want to wrap up. I think everyone, uh, we, we shared things. Of course, this is not all the conversation we can have. So if anything in this sparked anything in you, go to that link in the description and say, hey, can y'all talk more about this idea? Hey, can, can, you, can you say a little bit more about this? Or add your own thought. We'll read it and we'll talk about that. We want you to be a part of the conversation. But in our final lightning round here, we got a couple minutes left. I want to talk about who is your favorite side character or cameo or any of those kind of things in the movie. So. Sawyer, are there any characters or things that you just want to highlight? Like, this is my favorite character every time they came to us. So maybe like my favorite scene in the whole movie that's not like a touchy-feely scene, but is just like really funny is the scene where Vanellope hangs out with all the Disney princesses and basically just great. wrecks their lives. Points yes. out that one of them is being gaslit yeah. and the other one has like a Stockholm Syndrome or something like that. Which like is all the obvious stuff, but I I just I loved that whole scene. I was laughing my way yeah. through that whole scene. It was pretty good. That was a pretty good way for Disney to kind of reckon with their past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. Donnie, favorite character, favorite side character. Who you got? Um, I think basically it was probably like um, Fix It Felix. Um, but I my favorite part literally was when they had the thing where they were telling parents the perfect way to parent. And oh, then yes. all the sound effects that go over it every time they say something. That and the guy's like, everything. I wish every parrot could hear that right now. Exactly. I, I love thought that. that was great. <laughs> I thought that was great. Heidi, any character that just stands out to you as just the best side character? Um, yeah, definitely Spamly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Spamly. Yeah. So he is hilarious. And then when he gets um like knocked down by the pop-up blocker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he takes him to the shop and he's like, Oh, Oh, this is embarrassing. It's like disgusting. And, <laughs> and then the dark web and stuff, he's just, his whole character yeah. is hilarious and amazing. And I like that. He like is genuinely trying to help out trying to, you know, but yeah. he just is, he's just a scheming guy. <laughs> My favorite probably is, I think his character name is butcher boy. He's the, uh, he's like the really gruff guy in the, um, in the uh in like the whatever it's called murderville or whatever it's called slaughter race in the slaughter race game and he's always one that's like but if but you need to follow your zen you know he's like thank you for listening to me like i thought that character was just perfect i thought that was wonderful so hey we're glad you guys paid attention to this we hope that you will uh, have these great conversations whether you watch the movie or not talk to your kids about insecurity and how it can just be a, a cancer to our friendships our relationships and ultimately uh, our life in the kingdom of god uh, because jesus is always speaking truth to us and that was the solution at the end right is he had to learn uh, I, you have to trust her. You just have to trust that trust is the solution. But once again, taking that conversation farther, it's not even that you need, have to trust others. You have to trust God and you have to trust that the words Jesus is speaking to you, that you are safe, you are loved, you are cared for, that that's the biggest truth that we need to know. So I, we were wishing you luck as you have those conversations and teaching your children to love Jesus and his way of life even more. We'll see you next time.